We have David in Queensland. How are you? Oh, hi. Really well, thanks, Matt. Hey, how's yourself? I'm not too bad. Uh, say hi to Don as well. Thanks. Well, hi. Uh, well, you can say hi to him. You're on with you both of us. us. <laughs> of course. So did you did you have something for us? Um, yes. Well, uh, I've I've rung in because um, I'm a benevolent, or if you like, a uh, a controversy theist, and uh, I just thought that that might have uh, been of interest to you. So you believe in a God that's benevolent? Yes, that's that's correct. And I also believe that at this time, um, benevolent God or a God who is love, that there is a great controversy over whether this is true or not. Well, I'll agree with you that there's a controversy because I, I don't see any evidence for any God, benevolent or otherwise. Right. Um, what would lead you to you think know, that not only does God exist, but he's benevolent? And, and how benevolent? Well, um, I think that uh, you, you really shouldn't be able to put a limit on benevolence. Um, like if you I think you should be able God. to put a lower limit on benevolence. If your idea of benevolence is to allow people to enslave others and to sit around and do nothing while people are uh, molested and suffering, um, I don't know that you can consider yourself benevolent in any respect at all. But, you know, like... Well, I'm reminded immediately of the problem of evil. Right. Yeah. Where 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 does evil come from? If if you've got a presumably all powerful God that that knows everything and is benevolent. Yeah. This is why I'm asking how benevolent. It's not like there, I, I would agree. There's no upper limit on benevolence. Yes, and and I like the uh, question about the the problem of evil, and uh, I think that benevolence has to be something that is willing to be shared with everyone. Everyone has the opportunity of being benevolent or loving, and uh, if if I understand correctly, um, love cannot occur unless you have the freedom to do so. I mean, you should be able to free to love. I don't think that that's true. So um, what do you think would be necessary for love to occur? A brain. Right. So love is just the outworking of intellect only or just emotions? Well, if you're going to divide it between intellect and emotions, it's, it's both of them. But, you know, I don't choose who I fall in love with. And so the notion of freedom has, I don't see any grounds for that at all. But... Setting aside, see, this is one of the things that, that frustrates me is that you, you call in to say that you believe in a benevolent God, and then we end up talking about love. Um, I'm looking for what reason one would have to think that there is, in fact, a benevolent God. Well, um, <clears throat> I believe that uh, we can go down maybe the same track that Sir Isaac Newton used for believing in the Bible, and that would be prophecy. Okay, so now now we're not talking about a benevolent God at all, but now you want to talk about a biblical God? Well, I believe the biblical God is a benevolent God. So okay, well, me, I don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not only do I not think he exists, I don't think the character as represented is fairly considered to be benevolent in any sense. And also what Isaac Newton has to say about it is irrelevant. It, it might be a starting um, point for discussion, but it's, it's not. So, so the thing is, if I become convinced of something, I want it to be for good reasons, for arguments supported by evidence, not for appealing to, let me name a smart person who was monumentally wrong on many things, including alchemy, and uh, we'll go down that route. I don't care what Isaac Newton says. I don't care what Albert Einstein says. I, what I care about is what is the argument and what is the evidence that supports the argument. Now, if you believe there's a benevolent God, you must have a reason. And if your reason is nothing other than uh, you, you have special notions about love and you heard something from Isaac Newton, uh, you're never going to make any headway here. Okay, um, fair enough. Well, I believe that... Uh I believe because of the prophecies found in both Daniel and Revelation and uh, how they have been coming true, I believe supports the idea that God exists who knows the future. And, and I don't. And the problem with prophecy 
is that in order for a prophecy to be impactful at all, it needs to be specific and answerable by a clear, not interpreted set of circumstances. So you can't go to Daniel or Revelation, both of which sound like the ravings of madmen, and say, this says this, and I'm going to interpret it this way, and look, it seems to have come to pass. Because there's a number of problems. If I order a medium or a steak and I get a medium or a steak, the waiter's not fulfilling prophecy. If there are people actively working to bring around a state of Israel, then any prophecies about a state of Israel have nothing to do with you know, seeing the future. But at the end of the day, let's imagine that in Daniel there was a clear prophecy. X will happen. And it was clearly uh, answered by a specific circumstance that there's no ambiguity, no interpretation. Now you have a prediction and a prediction that, that has actually come to pass. We don't have that, but if we had that, what conclusion could we reach about the person who wrote that prediction down? Um, well, we could believe either they're, they're, they're pretty lucky or they're pretty good at predicting the future or they, they know the future. But if I may... But a there's a lot of other options as well. But how do, you tell the, how do you tell which of those is correct? Did they actually have four... You see, you can't even get to a point where you could demonstrate that they had foreknowledge of the future. But let's, let's, I'll, I'll go a step further. Let's say that you've done all the work to show that the author of Daniel actually had foreknowledge of the, of the future. He didn't get lucky but he knew what was going to happen and it came to pass. How did he know? Well, I mean, that is a, that is a difficult question. Um, and but you, you are convinced so. that you have answered it. You are convinced that not only is there a prediction that has come true, but evidently it should meet the, 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 the standards by which you know, we would consider it valid and that the reason this guy knew what was gonna happen in the future is because of God. Now, that is a chain of inferences. And I actually, there's a video I'm working on right now, which I, I have uh, cleverly titled Compound Inference, that demonstrates the problem with putting one inference on top of another. You, you have, I've, I've gone ahead and I've granted way more than any reasonable person should in order to demonstrate that even if you had, like I stand on stage and I make predictions about the future and read people's mind as part of my act. I am incredibly accurate. I can make amazing detailed predictions about what an audience is going to do and show that I have done it. Now the question then becomes, how did I do it? Was there a God that told me? Was there something else that told me? Did I have access to some knowledge base? Do I have a time machine? You can't narrow down, was it trickery? You can't narrow down which one of those is the answer. But when we look at these things, the likelihood that I use trickery seems to be far more likely than many of the other explanations. And if you think that I'm actually getting message from a god, that's something you'd have to demonstrate, not just assume or infer. Yes, uh, point taken. And I think it would have to be up to each person to, to decide. Well, that's um, garbage. Based, based of course, on that. of course, every person if gets to, to decide. Every person gets to decide for themselves. But the issue is, who's right? The fact that everybody gets to decide, I mean, there are people who decided that white people are better than black people. There are people who are decided that the earth is flat. Does that mean that they're remotely right? Does it mean that we should consider their opinions equal to those? Is it, does it mean that we have no way of evaluating what is true? Well, may I pass um, just one small prophecy by you and see sure. what you think? Sure. Um, well. Well, in, uh, in Daniel, and uh, some people think that it's written at various different times, but let's, let's just say that it was written, you know, around about the time of Christ. Let's not even put it before the time of Christ. And, um, Wait, so you're saying the book of Daniel was written around the time of Christ? I'm saying that I'm not demanding that everyone believe it was written before. So um, I don't think that you would believe that Daniel was written at about five or 600 B.C., I don't think I'd have too massive a problem with that rough time. I don't, it doesn't need to be dated anywhere near, you know, 300 or 30 CE. I mean, it's, you know, go ahead. Right. Okay. So in the book of Daniel, um, we have a dream in Daniel chapter two, where we have this statue. And uh, by having a look at it, the statue, there's a head of gold 
and the head of gold represents Babylon. And if we follow through the kingdoms that come after, we see that there's Babylon, followed by Medo-Persia, followed by Greece, followed by the Roman Empire. And if we allow that that was uh, written at about 500 uh, or so BC, then that's a fairly accurate prediction of the kingdoms that would follow each other on planet Earth. Bullshit. (laughs) <laughs> let's read. Let's read the actual passage because you just listed um, a number of civilizations by name in the order in which they occurred, and you're talking about a passage in Daniel where he has a dream about a statue with a head, and you think that this is—I I forget the exact phrasing you just used—but uh, prophetic. In any case, you think this is an a- the dream is an accurate representation of what happened. So let's what chapter and verse. Give me chapter and verse. We'll pull it up together. Um, Yes, yeah, so that would be Daniel uh, chapter 2. Uh, just having a look here. In, uh, near the beginning of Daniel chapter 2. Do you have a preferred Bible version? I'll just go with uh, King James because... Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Um, and so we have we have the dream that occurs earlier uh, in, in the chapter. And then... Uh, um, uh, if we come down um, to starting about verse 31 or so, Daniel interprets what the what the dream means. Right. So it wasn't even it wasn't even Daniel's dream. So that part you, That's right. was, you, you kind of skipped over. You you implied that Daniel had a dream, but actually it was Nebuchadnezzar that had the dream, and he asked Daniel to interpret it. Yes, yes, that's correct. It's a dream in the book of Daniel by Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. And um, so, so starting yeah, at verse 31, here, I'll just read this. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out with hand, without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that they were iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces, and became like the chaffs of summer threshing threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Now, that's the description of the dream. Yes. Yeah. So somebody dreamed about a statue uh, of, of gold and brass and silver and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, the interpretation uh, is... For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And where, where, whosoever, sorry, wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls and the heaven and the, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So he's saying Nebuchadnezzar is this head of gold. Yes. Okay. And Lord after Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Yeah. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom of brass, which shall rule over the earth. And it's basically saying what you saw is a prediction that after your kingdom, there'll be another kingdom and another kingdom and another kingdom. Right? Yes. Doesn't that happen all the time throughout history everywhere? Yes. And so uh, how is that remotely remarkable? Well, if we have a look down through these kingdoms, we see that we have the kingdom of, of, of Medo-Persia, um, then the kingdom of, of Greece, and then the kingdom after that will be Rome. And it's interesting how the legs were of iron, and Rome is kind of that iron kingdom that came forth really? uh, from Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, I find this to be uh, absolutely indicative of people f- finding exactly what they're looking for. This is not any sort of prediction that I would consider to be specific or impressive. It's obviously prone to interpretation since we have Daniel interpreting, interpreting the dream of a king to begin with. And none of these uh, things are, are named. So you're, you're basically, you have this limited set of information, and now you're going to try to find a way to piece it together with what we know happened afterwards. That's not a prophecy fulfilled. That is someone looking at the world and going, wow, I can make this fit. And it's, it's completely unsurprising when you consider that, as, I, as you and I both agreed, this is the sort of thing that happens. Now, now if, but here's the, here's the worst part of it. You're God. Let's say you're God. And, okay. and you want to set up something 
to convince David in 2018 that you are real and benevolent. So what you do is you have a king have a really weird dream and you send your guy down to interpret that dream in a way that is wholly unremarkable and will not be even subject to, to proof or confirmation for centuries. And that way, David, when he reads the Bible, can go through and say, ah, yeah, look, this kind of matches up. And yet you manage to get so many other things wrong, like the order of events in creation or whether or not we should own people as property. So this is an example where somebody's gone in and cherry-picked something and said, you know what? This seems to predict what happened afterwards. And yet there's nothing remarkable in it. And there's no way to prove that it was a prediction made with foreknowledge. And if you could prove that it was a prediction made with foreknowledge, you couldn't prove how that person came by that foreknowledge. Is it that remarkable that somebody summoned before a king and asked to interpret their dream, that that person would have said something that seems to pertain to the dream that could possibly be viewed as coming true and yet is absolutely unverifiable at the time? The king rewards Daniel for this uh, interpretation, even though he has no reason to believe that the interpretation is true. None. Because none of those things have happened in the course of this discussion. So somebody walks in and tells the king, hey, look, when your kingdom falls, there'll be another one after that, and another one after that, and another one after that. I'm like, wow, that's the best interpretation of a dream I've ever heard. Congratulations, you are now a man of, of, of measure. And, and God is doing all of this so that you'll have a justification to think that there's a benevolent God? Well, um, there's also another uh, dream in Daniel chapter 7. Now, this one here gives very little detail and Is it really isn't enough to believe anything. Then, then, okay, uh, why, would you go, why would you go to a less compelling argument after the first one? All right. Well, um, because the, the, the dream in Daniel chapter 7 is actually very, very specific. If we take Daniel chapter 7 and 8, they're incredibly specific. Does it have dates? <laughs> yes, it, it, has, it has a time period that is met precisely to the year. Well, what humor are you, it looks like? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, in Daniel chapter 7, um, we have this idea of kingdoms, one coming after another, also repeated, except this time, instead of being represented as metals in a statue, it's represented by different beasts. And so there's there's a lion with wings, um, there's, there's a bear, there's, there's a cheetah, and then there's um, an, a, a terrifying beast. And those four beasts lie in the other four metals. <laughs> well, they do sound a bit that way. Uh, they line up with the four metals in the statue. And once again, we come through um, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. Um, now, this kind of understanding is uh, if you go to the city of Nuremberg, there's a public building there and there's two entrances to the public building. If you look at the two entrances above the public building, you'll actually see the the rulers of these four kingdoms and those four beasts there. So this is a very, very common understanding that uh, people have shared for many, many centuries. Does that have any bearing on whether or not it's true? No, but... No, uh, then there's no reason to raise it, right? Be well, because if there's something that has no bearing on whether or not something's true, raising it in a discussion about truth is essentially poisoning the well. It's an attempt to ring in credibility that's not deserved. I wasn't meaning to do that. I was just well, trying to show I'm not, that this is not just my personal understanding. That's all. Sure, I understand that. I wasn't the, trying that's to get any thing. authority on that. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I don't want to get any authority from that, though. Um, so when you get to the fourth beast, you would think, oh, kingdom, 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 kingdom maybe another kingdom, but instead the fourth beast has ten horns on it, which says are the next, so that fourth beast is then supplanted by ten kings or ten kingdoms. And incredibly, um, when Rome falls in about 476 uh, CE, we have that Rome wasn't supplanted by another kingdom as such, but it was divided more or less into ten kingdoms. And that's, that's a fairly specific... Um, no, it's not. Change. No, it's not. It's you see, you're you're following this path, and then what? What if what if when Rome 
had split, then instead of being 10, which I'm not necessarily convinced is accurate anyway, it just been two. And then the one after that had split into 10. Yes, we'll see that. That wouldn't fit the prophecy. Oh, I bet you I bet you people would just say that one, one of them didn't count. The fact of the matter is you need a prophecy that predicts something so specific that it can only be answered by a single occurrence with no interpretation. And a god would know this. Any god that is using this method, any god that is giving people dreams about beasts and statues and then having someone interpret them and then letting people uh, a millennia later go back and see if they can massage things to fit. Spin doctorate is a jackass and not very bright. Because if the purpose is to show that you exist and to guide people to an understanding that you're a benevolent God who's here, why not just talk to people? Um, well, he has talked to people Prove in, it. in past, if my Prove understanding it. is correct. Prove it. Well, uh, well, this is what this uh, prophecy is about. He hasn't, he hasn't talked to me. To go further. He hasn't talked to me, and until he does, he's not worth five minutes of my time. If we can go through a few more specifics, it also says that three of those kingdoms would be uprooted by another kingdom that is not just only a civil power, that's also religious. And if we go back to around about 476 AD after Rome divided up, we see that a religious power came to, to the fore, which was the pontifical power, um, because in one way, um, the Roman civil power got overthrown, got superseded by the uh, Rome religious power. Did, but before did, the Rome did, religious, did, uh, did the universe end with Rome, or was there anything after that? No, there's, there's it, Rome got divided up into about ten kingdoms. About ten. I thought it was um, exactly ten. Well, ten kingdoms, and then. And then uh, three of them got uprooted <laughs> by a religious power. So if we have a look at that historically, yeah. Um, so in four, in 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 um, five thirty eight, we, we are completely wasting time because you've already acknowledged that you have no way to demonstrate that there was actually foreknowledge and that it actually came from God. Correct. A, an understanding of this prophecy does. It's I not prophecy it's just because you news. call it prophecy. The, I, I, I started at the very beginning of the call pointing this out. I granted everything I could possibly grant to show that even if there was a, a specific prophecy that actually turned out to be true, you still don't have any sort of evidence or mechanism to show how and why that person wrote that. D did they know about the future and how did they know about the future? You have no way of showing that. It's just what you believe. Um, well, I do believe that if people can tell the the future accurately uh, in in sort of like for hundreds of centuries, that that does show something. Oh, and actually, I don't, I don't see any prophecy. accuracy there. I don't. Not only do I see any accuracy, but the, the longer the time is between the interpretation or between the prophecy and the event, the more uh, likelihood it is to come true. Hey, here's a prophecy for you. The United States will the United States will elect a woman as president. Um, you would have to say the next president of the United States would be a woman. <laughs> Funny well, you, how you, you want, want high specifics standards now for, for Matt's prophecy, yeah. but you yeah. got low standards for yours. <laughs> yeah. So with the prophecy, we have specifically you, you, four kingdoms, and then the next. So what, is, did they name the kingdoms? Did they name the dates? I, you know, uh, animals are not kingdoms. Materials from statues are not kingdoms. Well, in Daniel, it says that the animal, the beast, is a kingdom. That's that's what it actually says. If if you, uh, I don't it, it does say care. Is a kingdom. <laughs> as yeah. I pointed out earlier, Daniel reads like the ravings of a madman, as does Revelation, and this sets all of these things in the context of interpretation. There's no way for you to demonstrate this, and it is, by definition unreasonable for you to reach the conclusion that the best explanation for this convergence of, of a supposed prediction and event is that God knows the future and exists. You can't, you, 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 when, we, when we want to say, how did this happen? How did this person write something that we think came true? We list 
candidate explanations. Ah, he had trickery. He was the doctor. He had a time machine. Uh, he guessed and got lucky. He made predictions that weren't particularly uh, specific. And centuries later, people went back and looked and said, ah, oh, yeah, well, if you interpret it this way, then it came true. Uh, those are all candidate explanations because we know all of those things can happen. The candidate explanation that you've chosen is one that we don't know can happen. You have, you have by definition, leaped to the one explanation for which we do not have any examples of it ever being a correct explanation. Well, that would be under the assumption that uh, there is no supernatural. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, 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 sir. It's not under any assumption. It's not under an assumption. You are off, you are suggesting that the best explanation is one that has never shown to be correct. I don't have to deny the supernatural or anything else. There is no point in history in which God did it has been demonstrated to be the correct explanation. Um, well, that's where you and I would disagree. And that's why uh, you're wrong. And that's, that's, that's fair enough. It's fair enough. We disagree. We disagree. Before we go on, yeah, uh, isn't there some sort of Bible prophecy about uh, the kingdom of um, Tyr? Um, um, Abraham and his line going forever? No, his descendants will become as numerous as the stars. Oh, not forever. Not forever. Okay. There are way more stars. You still make way more stars. But <laughs> we're not done yet. Yeah, I think he it's, hung up on somebody that didn't yeah, call back. Yeah, that was actually, uh, <laughs> it's an accident, but my, my call screener app evidently is not refreshing. Uh, so we'll try that again. Yeah, the, the, the prophecy stuff gets tiresome pretty quick. Well, it's, it's, here's the thing, and this is what I tried to demonstrate. If you were God, this is one of the chapters in the book deals with prophecy, the, the, the If I Were God book. What is my goal? Hey, I want to give people information so that they can have a reasonable foundation to believe in me. And my method for doing this is to give somebody a dream and then ask somebody else to interpret that dream in such a way that if we kind of squint one eye and lean a little to the left, we can look back 700 years later and see that, oh yeah, that kind of lines up. That's actually pretty good. At the, and, and there is no reasonable way at the end of that trail of thought to reach the conclusion that, you know what, the best explanation is that God did this. Well, and there's nothing remarkable in this dream, right? It's, it's uh, you know, if, if he came down and explained quantum mechanics to us <laughs> in a way that worked out, that would be, that'd be pretty imp impressive, right? Yeah. We'd still, we still wouldn't be sure it was a God, but it'd be a hell of a lot more impressive than this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's frustrating because, it's, so, the, David, not, I, I'm, this is not about IQ, this is not about intelligence or smarts or anything else. This is about having a sound epistemology. This is about the, the tools of skepticism and critical thinking. The, because it's very easy, incredibly easy, especially if you're raised in a church, to say, look, here's what it says in Daniel, and here's something that matches it. Yeah. Holy cow. Only God could have known. And as long as you're already in the mindset that God is a reasonable explanation for things, then it's, that is the way it is. It's like, oh, it's when I debated Mike Lacona on the resurrection, he spent all his time trying to argue from floating trash can lids and Ouija boards that the, that the universe has a spiritual aspect to it. And he did all of that so that he could kind of smuggle in the resurrection because then it would seem more reasonable. The thing is, the debate wasn't about how the resurrection happened. It was about whether or not the resurrection happened. And if the debate is about whether the resurrection happened, then all of this hand waving about supernatural and Ouija boards, and that's all irrelevant. Because the only thing you have to show me to convince me that a resurrection occurred is here's a person, well documented that this person's dead. Preferably, I would like to check it out, you know, some or at least uh, reasonable doctors, etc. Some period of time uh, beyond which people don't uh, recover. And then the person gets up and walks in. He even went to this thing of having the person's head cut off, and if they walked in the room afterwards, uh, you know, with her head back on, would I then believe in the supernatural? And I said, no, but I would believe that somebody who I thought to be dead was now alive. 
Uh, how it happened is a second, second, a yeah, separate issue, it's a separate thing, right? It's it's weird that you know at the end of this, it's just like, well, I'm a, I, I I have seen no evidence anywhere that God did it has been demonstrated to be the correct explanation. Right. Well, and the, the caller it's an often thinks used explanation, but but not a correct. One. Yeah, <laughs> and yet the caller seems to think that oh, it has been shown. Right. So because from now on, you can point at a mystery and say God did it. <laughs> instead of calling to tell me that you believe in a benevolent God, which we never really did get to get to, uh, yeah, boy, uh, we if, went down the rabbit hole pretty quick. <laughs> if the issue is why do you believe that that, that a God exists, and you're just like, oh well, it's prophecy, and God has been the correct explanation. No, it hasn't. Yeah, that's the that's the part where we need to start. Dan Barker has a pretty good book on the you know the God of the Bible and his character, and yeah, so. Uh, yeah, read read that one. <laughs> it, it's it, it's funny for me because even when I was a believer, looking at Daniel and Revelation and seeing these things that people were holding up as prophecies, um, it, it's a lot of cherry picking. It is a lot of interpretation, mm -hmm. and then you have like the author of the Book of Matthew was so fond of prophecy that he even invented some out of whole cloth for Jesus to fulfill. And it's one of those things of we have no mechanism to demonstrate how a prediction came true. God should know that. Right. So why is God running around, I will prove it to you with prophecies. I will, it's like saying, you know, uh, I will prove it to you through your feels. Your feels are proof of nothing other than that you have feels. But I'll just make you feel it. And that'll be proof. That's not a smart God. That's not a God that understands how things should be proven. Yeah. It's certainly not a God that designed the human brain. It's like this all-powerful God coming down and pulling a quarter from behind your ear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Enough, enough really bad magic. We have, uh, is it 